Is he? I don't know if he's still there. Right? I think he's gonna work up to this. Oh, okay, thank you. All right, so uh, looking at the, what the fuck is this? <laughs> <laughs> this is what's wrong with your car. There are no pages in the car. Found that in the gas tank. Okay. So my technician said that you have a flat front tire and there's no gas in the car. Um, what well, really seems a lot like Hey everybody, Aaron Cowan, Sage Dynamics. This week's video, I wanted to talk a little bit about active shooter response for the citizen. Help, help. Oh, what the fuck? Where's he at? I'm here to help. Help, help me, help, help. Where's he at? I'm here to help. Somebody call the cops! They got him! Now, I first started teaching attitude response in law enforcement uh, almost a decade ago. I've uh, been through a couple schools that taught at the instructor level on how to instruct officers both in, in mainly in, in team-based response. And when I was in the Department of Defense, I just came to the realization that it's it's very impractical and very unlikely for there to be a number of officers who arrive at the same side of a building at the same time to respond in a team base uh, to an active shooter. Um, after Columbine, law enforcement got away from the established perimeter called SWAT, which is a behavior they had for pretty much every instance, including active shooters. Columbine, so many lives were lost, law enforcement took a hard look at their techniques and their tactics and said, we need something new. So that's where the modern active shooter response training came from, but it, be it began to get more and more and more team-based, just like SWAT tactics. So the, the problem I saw was, just like I said, the, the, the realism. Are you gonna have four officers or three officers or even two officers respond to the same building on the same side at the same door at the same time in order to form a team and make entry and use those tactics? I hope so. However, if you look at the reality of the situation, we look at past active shooter events, that's just not been the case. Um, we want as many officers as possible to respond, but I don't like the idea, I never liked the idea, of an officer just tactically loitering at a door waiting for two or three more officers to show up before he can make entry because that's either their policy or that's how they're trained and he doesn't think to himself, well, I'm a patrol guy and I do everything else pretty much by myself unless I really need help. But this one time, I'm gonna wait for four, four three, two other officers before I make entry. It's, to me, it's incomprehensible. Uh, the majority of the cops that I know would just go ahead and say, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and go in there and stop this guy. Now, I start with that because if you look at the statistics, and I'll put some up on the screen, um, and I'm not a huge, like, let's just only look at the statistics guy, but we have to go on what we know, what we know has happened, and what kind of patterns have emerged. Now, there's a hundred million possible variables that can go into any situation, but there are some constants, and there are some patterns that do emerge the further back we go and the harder we look at the, the active shooter, if you want to use that term, events that have taken place. And the common denominator is the fact that, well, citizens are present because they're the target. And usually it's a soft target. It's somewhere that's a gun-free zone. And again, that can become a political discussion. I don't really want to get into that. But we're looking at a situation where citizens are always there. And if you look at the statistics, it's citizens who predominantly stop the active shooters. And then if you dig a little deeper, you'll find that the majority of active shooters, or a, or a high percentage, have been stopped by unarmed civilians or citizens. I prefer the term citizen. Uh, what does that say? Does that mean that we don't need to carry guns? Absolutely not. What it says is most of your active shooting situations have taken place in areas that are either historically, legally, or through some kind of policy, a gun-free zone. Now, the purpose of this video isn't to teach you how to respond to an active shooter. Uh, I do have a two-day uh, citizen, respond citizen response to active shooter class, and it's two days because it needs to be two days. There's just no way I can put it into a video uh, unless that video was 16 hours long, and even then it would only be a supplemental to training. Um, I conduct my active shooter training with sim munitions as opposed to live fire because it's you can't get the same realism out of paper as you do sim munitions. 
And that's the reason my class is developed that way. That's the reason it's two days. There's a lot of technique and a lot of theory that has to be gone over. But just talking about the common sense, we've got we've got two and two main issues when it comes to getting yourself mentally prepared, at least, uh, for action shooter response. We've got the political nature of the situation, which is inescapable, uh, and then we have the the facts of what you can and can't avoid. Now, when I train just specific self-defense, uh, I like to lump crimes into two general categories, and they are general. I use that word specifically. You have profit crimes, you have personal crimes. Profit crimes are crimes where there's some kind of criminal profit, uh, a car, a wallet, you drive you to the ATM so you get all your money out of it, your jewelry, your watch, your cell phone, profit. There's some kind of transaction that needs to play, take place under penalty of injury that's going to make you comply. A personal crime would be a road rage situation, a disgruntled coworker, a spouse, a brother, a cousin, a friend, a former friend, any number of things. The crime is specifically personal based on the fact that either you angered that person or they want to hurt you for some personal reason. The active shooter, active, uh, active killer, spree killer, mul multiple mass murder, whatever terminology you want to use, the terminology becomes important because it allows us to desensitize the situation, which I feel is very dangerous. That's why the, the term active shooter has just become so common that we, we kind of lose sight of the gravity uh, of the situation just by hearing those words. We hear them and we're just like, oh, okay. The active shooter is motivated strictly by the desire to kill. Um, you could consider that. That might fall into the category of a personal crime if you really want to think about it. Uh, sometimes they know the people, sometimes they don't. Uh, the most recent shooting we had in San Bernardino uh, was, let's just be honest, uh, it was motivated by terrorism. It was motivated by terrorist groups. And people say, well, you know, they weren't, they weren't members of ISIS. I don't really understand how you could say that. Uh, I'm sure they didn't train with ISIS, they didn't chill with ISIS, they didn't kick it with ISIS, watch TV with ISIS. Uh, but they were motivated by ISIS, and since ISIS isn't, a structure, ISIS isn't a structured military, paramilitary, law enforcement, or relief organization, how exactly do you determine membership? Is there a card? How does that work? Motivation to the degree of action on their part, to me, means member of. And that's just my opinion. Uh, some people are going to disagree. Um, some people still have this, this Cold War mentality of geographically located membership. So if you didn't spend time with ISIS in the Middle East, there's no way you could be a member. If you didn't send, spend time with Al-Qaeda, there's no way you could be a member. We're going to use the term lone wolf, which I heard, which I found ironic because there were two shooters. So we had two lone wolves. I anyway, uh, so back to my point, motivated to kill. The motivation is irrelevant insofar as prevention is concerned. Someone's desire to kill Americans or someone's desire to kill their coworkers, or someone's desire to kill random people just so they can get their kill count up and become famous, and the media is definitely going to help with that, um, is largely irrelevant when it comes to prevention. Knowing that someone wants to kill us because we're American does not really help us prevent it in our day-to-day -day lives. And I'm speaking from, from a citizen's point of view. Now, the military can say these people want us dead, and then if we had you know, a really good administration that was really pro-military and pro-preemptive uh, action, we could just bomb the shit out of them. Uh, and hopefully, eventually, they'd be like, you know what, I'm going to pick up my jacks and go home because every time I start tweeting on Twitter that I'm going to kill Americans, my terrorist camps get blown up. Um, that's a different conversation. So, does understanding someone's motive help us prevent the attack? No. But what we can do is look at the situation as a whole. Anything worth taking by force should be protected by force. Now, I use that, um, that statement in my home defense class specifically but it does apply to active shooter situations as well. Um, you look at banks, there's a lot of money in banks, not as much as there used to be. Um, the days of hitting the vault are kind of done, but there's still a lot of money in the, in the tenders and a guy could go in and, and make off a couple thousand dollars. So banks are protected by active security system, fast police response times, hopefully. Uh, and a lot of times either bulletproof glass, bullet resistant glass, some kind of caging system and armed security or armed law enforcement, off duty law enforcement. Um, sporting events, it's a game, two teams, right? But there's cops everywhere, why is that? Who is actually being protected? I would go ahead and risk to venture that the protection isn't there at behest of the, the community so much as it is at the request of the sporting organizers. Who's really being protected there? Um, granted, law enforcement security at a sporting event, if something does go down, they're going to do what they do. Um, but they're not there to protect the people so much as they are to tr protect the organization and the profit. Anything that's worth money, a considerable amount of money, or anytime there's a transaction of wealth, there's usually some kind of armed security present, usually some kind of law enforcement present. We have the lowest level of protection that a private business or even a public organization can have, and that's just put up signs that say gun-free zone. 
Uh, this creates soft targets because most gun owners are responsible law-abiding citizens. Um, majority, overwhelming majority of us are law-abiding citizens, and the statistics definitely reflect that. So if we see a theater that says no guns allowed, we're more likely to just go to a different theater or, unfortunately, some people leave their firearm in their car or not bring it with them at all. Now, I'm of the mindset that concealed means concealed. Um, I, depending on the state, you know, it depends on what your penalties are. Some of them, they can just issue a trespass warning and, and that's it. Other states, uh, if you carry a firearm into a place where a sign is posted that says no, no firearms allowed, you risk a misdemeanor. Um, everything is, is going to vary and, and violating those, those ordinances or those business policies is a completely personal decision. Concealed means concealed. Um, so we have these soft targets. Now, banks are going to have guns, sporting events are going to have guns, um, political rallies are going to have law enforcement present, private security present, bodyguards present, things like that. Uh, but none of them are there to protect you. Uh, and this goes back to my, my number one lesson for anybody is owning a firearm is taking personal responsibility for your life and the lives of anyone you choose to protect. In an active shooter situation, if you're a single guy, or if you just happen to be there by yourself, or if you don't have any children, or wife, or girlfriend, or anything like that, that net can be widely cast. You can protect your fellow man, a very altruistic action. Um, but then you think about, well, what if I have children with me, or what if I just have kids? You know, dad's got to, dad or mom have to go home. Like, that's, that's priority number one, and I completely respect that. Um, I wouldn't want anybody to sacrifice the ability to provide for their children in order to, to unrealistically try to, try to save lives. Um, you have to take care of what you have to take care of. But I know, just from the quality of students that I have, the quality of my alumni, the people I see in classes, um, as well as other instructors and their students and things like that, that we're very proactive when it comes to protection of life. It's one of the reasons that we do what we do. It's one of the reasons that we train. But you have to have a realistic expectation of the situation and your ability to perform in it. So what can be done? Well, first things first, train. I don't mean practice, there's a difference. Uh, training is proper instruction of correct techniques under uh, professional tutelage. Practice is taking those techniques and practicing them to proficiency, then going back and getting more training. Never any process. I understand training is expensive. The cost of not getting training, however, is much, much higher. Um, we live in a free market capitalist society. Some people charge a little bit more for their training. Some, you know, and if you want specialized training, you have to be willing to pay a little bit more money. Uh, I don't want to get into, you know, what's what the worth is, where the value is as far as money. Like, is this too much? Is this too little? I'm not going to get into that. Uh, what I will say is it's very hard to reach out into the world. And if you look around and find active shooter response training for the citizen. Now, when I started teaching the citizen, I had some of my old SWAT buddies call me up on the phone and say, what the f are you doing? To which I responded, what are you talking about? Two really good friends of mine had a took issue with the fact that I was providing SWAT techniques or cop techniques to citizens. There are two things I won't teach a citizen. That's helicopter insertions and explosive breaching. Main reason being that they don't have ready access to explosives. It would be very hard for them to justify using them. And the majority of citizens don't own helicopters. Now, if I had a bunch of rich guys come to me or, you know, maybe somebody who just had a little helicopter and said, hey, I want to learn how to do a helicopter insertion, I'd be like, you know what? I know how to do it, not really my lane. Let me get you to somebody who can teach it better than I can because that's not my instructor level stuff. Gonna stay in my lane. I firmly believe that there is no level of skill that a citizen shouldn't have access to. However, they can't jump to the higher functioning skill set without first understanding the fundamentals. And I know the, the term fundamentals gets beat to death and some people lose sight of what the fundamentals even are. But active shooter response, the first step is the fundamentals of realistic marksmanship. I'm not talking about shooting bullseyes, and there's nothing wrong with that, but it, iso it isolates a skill, it isolates accuracy. But I'm talking about understanding the ability to problem solve in real time. And that kind of training is something that you're just not gonna get from NRA basic pistol. Great class, don't get me wrong. Well, of course, based on the, you know, the quality of the instructor, I can't say blanket, because there's so many different people teaching it. What I will say is, it's going to help you, but it's not the best technique or best training to prepare you for active shooter response. You got to start there though, you have to, because you can't jump into F1 driving without first getting your learner's permit. Firearms is one of those things where people just assume, and they call this the leg wobegon effect, uh, everyone assumes that they are higher than average skill set. And when I say everyone, I mean a majority. Uh, I don't mean 100%, but in any given room, you're gonna have, if you were to conduct a poll, you're gonna have 
a vast majority of people who assume they are an above average shooter. When if you took those same people out on the range and put them through a situation in which none of them had ever been through, but they were required to meet accuracy or maybe even time and accuracy standards, you'd find that a small minority of them were actually capable of performing it. So it's about having an objective view of your own skill set. Um, I have a, an alumni of mine who likes to say, uh, your body can't go where your mind hasn't been. And to, to a certain degree, he's definitely right when it comes to what we think about with active shooter response. So what kind of training do you need? Well, you need functional realistic training. And I'm not gonna go ahead and promote my classes, but you can, you know, there's a video uh, on the YouTube channel in there somewhere, the active shooter response, citizen response to active shooter, and you can check that out. What I am gonna say is just when it comes to mindset and your everyday carry equipment. When it comes to self-defense mindset, some people stop at, well, I sit facing the door. We all do, congratulations. That's not even really worth mentioning. Um, that's almost like saying, hey, I, I, I put my pants on this morning, I know how to tie my shoes. I'm not trying to take anything away from your preparation, but that is not a measure of mindset when it comes to being prepared to defend yourself and your loved one and your family members in public. That's like basic functioning level, that's it. Um, do you think about where you go, why you're there, and what the likelihood of is that situation being a soft target? A movie theater, to me, is probably the worst place to go if you think about where's the risk. Because movie theater is, well, it's dark, everyone is facing the same direction, and it's very easy to control the entrances and the exits. We saw that in Aurora, Colorado. Will it happen again? Uh, I hope not. It almost happened in Texas. Luckily, there was a law enforcement officer on scene and was able to stop the shooter. But that's not the, that's not the norm. The norm, like I said, is the citizen stopping the shooter. So when it comes to mindset, what should you do? Well, have a realistic expectation of your ability to perform. Um, if you have kids, especially small children, how on point are your one-handed shooting skills? I bring this up because if you got a three, four, five, six, eight, ten year old, you might have to carry them, which takes at least one arm. So that leaves one hand to run your firearm. So how often do you practice shooting with one hand? How, how often do you practice your draw with one hand from concealment? What about your wife? Maybe you gotta pull your wife behind you, push your wife out of the way, push her to cover, push your children to cover. Maybe you have an elderly mother, elderly father, grandmother, grand, grandfather, what have you. Maybe it's just a total stranger, someone else's kid. Right now, we're factoring in more realism than what we consider our basic fundamental marksmanship. Now I have to focus on, okay, I, I need to be able to shoot one-handed a lot better than I, than I have. Now I want two hands on the gun, believe me. But if I have to scoop up a three-year-old, and run the gun, or if I have to scoop up a three-year-old and maintain a point of aim, I'm reduced to one hand. That's just one small thing that maybe some of you didn't even think about. Oh, wow. Even the draw stroke. Wow, you know, maybe maybe I would have to draw my gun with one hand because I do have small children. What if I have a, a stroller or, you know, any number of other things? That's just one small aspect, one small kernel of information that maybe you didn't consider. And if you did consider it and you've been practicing, awesome. That's great. Now let's think about the situation as a whole. You have to be prepared for violence. You have to be prepared for carnage, bloodshed, and you have to be prepared to deliver as much violence as you are legally able to stop the shooter. That's the basis of mindset. Situational awareness is just gonna factor into paying attention to things that don't fit. Um, the easiest way for someone to get away with anything is to act like they're supposed to be doing it. Anyone else is going to stand out. That gut feeling, trust it. You don't necessarily have to act on it. We want people to be able to articulate or at least pay attention to what they find suspicious because the word suspicion is just a conclusion. It doesn't actually by itself mean anything. It tells me that you find something strange, but it doesn't tell me why. So conclusions can be dangerous. We want to be able to articulate what it is and why we feel that way. And we don't want to dismiss those feelings. There have been plenty of times in the past when you, when you look at the aftermath investigation of a shooting or something like that where they say, well, you know, the neighbors thought they were weird or this person thought they were weird or this person thought they were acting up at work or this person said, you know, they had these mental health issues or all these things and nobody said anything. And that's the most aggravating fact of human interaction is we've gotten to a point in society that we're so worried about hurting people's feelings or we're so worried about a seeming racist or we're so worried about we want to stay politically correct that we're not going to fucking say anything. That could lead to, or add to, or be complicit in the loss of innocent life. New York had a thing for a long time. I think they still have the posters. If you see something, say something. That's part of it. And I'm not talking about phoning in on your neighbors, giving the FBI a call or something like that. I'm talking about if you notice someone out of place in a movie theater, if they are not behaving as if everyone else is, there might be a reason for that. 
Maybe that reason is completely innocent. Maybe they're just milling around shuffling because they're nervous and it's a first date. We've all been there. We know what it feels like. And if we know what something feels like, we usually know what it looks like. If something looks out of place, it probably is. I can't get into the minutia of microexpressions, pre-assault indicators, um, aggressive behavior, uh, try to subdue aggressive behavior, things like that. Uh, because again, uh, I teach a two-day class, I can't fit it all into this video. Um, and really, the class should be longer, but people's schedules mean what they are. I try to get everything, I try to get the big stuff into two days. Be aware of your surroundings. That's probably a really good cliche right next to the fundamentals of marksmanship. It becomes a cliche because we don't think about it enough. We don't critically think about the, t the, uh, uh, the topic. <sighs> Approach every situation as if the potential for an active shooter is high. I'm not talking about being paranoid. I'm talking about being prepared. I approach every single time I drive as a potential for a vehicle accident. Seatbelts, airbags, slowing down in the rain, turning my headlights on, turning my four-wheel drive on if it's snow on the ground or whatever. I am taking precautions based on the environment. So if I'm outside of an environment that I control or it's a gun-free zone or it's close to an area that has historically been a target of active shooters, active killers, mass free killers, whatever you want to call them, I'm going to be a little bit more aware of the situation. That doesn't mean change your lifestyle and don't go to the movies, but what it does mean is pay attention to where you sit, pay attention to your everyday carry. If you're in a movie theater and you don't have a flashlight, a handheld flashlight, you are wrong. A weapon mounted light is great once the gun needs to come out, but until the gun needs to come out, a handheld light can save your life. Um, that's just basic, basic everyday carry uh, advice. If you don't have a handheld light, I don't care what time of day it is, you're wrong. Just straight up. Now, obviously, our next topic, and I've actually gotten messages, uh, private messages on Instagram, a couple emails about this. What do you do as a citizen uh, if you engage an active shooter in law enforcement response? How do you behave with the law enforcement response? Um, the situation is gonna be chaotic, and the law enforcement officer who first gets there, uh, the amount of information he actually has is gonna be directly related to how far away he was when he started his call. Meaning, if he's a block away, he knows absolutely nothing by the time he gets there. I'll just go ahead and guarantee that. If he's coming from five, six blocks away, maybe, you know, if a rural area, you think about five, 10, 15 miles, he's probably got a lot of information because the dispatcher has time to collect and deliver, collect and deliver, collect and deliver, collect and deliver. Uh, rural areas, you might see that. Every officer, especially if you're getting officers from different agencies, are gonna have different information. Um, some active shooter calls have come in as just uh, a, dis a noise disturbance, or they've been called in, you know, as a domestic or something like that. And the officers didn't know what they were getting into until they actually got there. And usually by the time I get there, it's over. Uh, more, more often than not, we see shooters just self-terminate. It's rare for them to shoot it out with cops, but it happens. I can't specifically predict the situation, obviously. Uh, but what I will say is responding officers are going to be looking for the shooter, uh, if they know there's a shooter. And they're obviously going to be keyed in on anybody with a firearm. It's common sense not to wave your gun or point your gun at a, at a police officer. But a lot of people are worried about, well, if I just have the gun in my hand, I might get shot. Um, Law enforcement doesn't shoot people when they can more often uh, than you'd believe. Um, if you are responsive to verbal commands and hopefully they give them, uh, then you shouldn't have any issue. If an officer tells you to throw your gun down, throw your gun down. Tells you to set your gun down, set your gun down. I can't tell you that you should holster up before the officer responds because I don't know what situation you're going to be in. You may still need to actively have your firearm in your hand. I do not know. But speaking as a police officer, we can usually... To a, to a rough degree, just off of perception and collecting the totality of a situation, the environment, the body language, the mannerisms, the dress, the attire, all these things, we can tell if we're looking at a good guy or not more often than not. There are obviously some very tragic exceptions to that. People who didn't need to be shot have been shot, but if you look at the overall number of good shoots to bad shoots, it doesn't even register as a percentage. Now, of course, that's no consolation at all if you get shot by law enforcement when you're the good guy, and I understand the apprehension and the worry about that. But I can't say do A only or do B only. What I can tell you is be ready to respond at a seconds, half a seconds, fraction of a seconds notice to any verbal command that law enforcement gives you. And I have to stress this because there are a lot of people, I'm not going to say a lot, there are some people out there that have this mentality about them of fuck the police. I'm a good guy. I'm a gun owning responsible citizen. That's awesome. The cop doesn't know that. You're a veteran. Cop doesn't fucking know that either. You vote Republican. Maybe he's a Democrat. I don't know. That is irrelevant to the information that the officer has at the time. 
You may be the most law-abiding pro-cop citizen in the world. The officer does not know that. He has to go off of the, and again, it's a cliche, but it's true, usually, officer safety. He's going to tell you to put your gun down. Holy shit, you're involved. There's a shooting going on, or there was a shooting that had gone on. You're in an environment where people have been shot. Prudence dictates the officer is going to want to control every firearm in that environment because that's his job. So give law enforcement a little bit of a break when it comes to a situation like that. They're doing what they're supposed to do. They're doing what they're paid to do. They will treat you with respect once they understand the situation, and hopefully they treat you with this respect, and maybe an aggressive respect, immediately. Now, there's, there are some products out there you can help identify yourself as a CCW, off-duty cop, security, sheriff's deputy, whatever. Uh, there's a company out in Reno, Nevada. I'll, I'll throw the name up on the screen. At least I think they're in Reno. Uh, they make a, a little belt sash that you can pull out and throw. It's kind of like an Army PT belt, but it actually serves more of a purpose. And it does have a neon green if you want, or, or yellow, or whatever. And it has the words, and it's clearly seen. Um, so that's something that, that's an option. That's probably one of the best options I've seen, short of taking like a full road guard vest out of your 511 cargo pants and putting that on, getting your whistle, uh, maybe putting on goggles for safety. Because, um, you know, sometimes EDC gear gets a little bit ridiculous. Uh, but that's just an option. It's a visual representation that maybe law enforcement is prepared to see and that says, hey, you know, that's, that's probably a good guy. Uh, that doesn't mean you shouldn't listen to verbal commands just because like, hey, I got my CCW sash on. I'm not putting my gun down. Don't do that. Uh, but it is a visual option because a lot of people, they want some kind of visual way they can let law enforcement know that we're on the same team. Um, there's terminology you can use, and it varies. Uh, for law enforcement, you know, uniform cop to off-duty cop, we use blue on blue. Um, there's no law against you saying that. It's not like you're trying to impersonate a police officer. It's just letting him know instantly that we have a phrase, and I understand the phrase. Um, and, of course, somebody's going to get butt hurt that I put that out there, but it's already out there, guys. Um, I'm not the first person to give that advice. I won't be the last. It's good, solid advice, um, and it's going to help. Now, um, as far as contact with law enforcement, especially if you're the one that calls 911, the biggest thing you can do is give a physical description of yourself and underscore exclamation points, bold and italics, the fact that you are giving your physical description. I can't, I can't stress that enough. You don't want to give a physical description and have the dispatcher think you're giving the physical description of the suspect. What you're doing is you're letting law enforcement know, hey, there's a good guy on scene. This is what he looks like. Stay on the phone with 911 the entire time. Might come back to those one-handed shooting skills. If you got to keep your gun out, maybe you got one at, one at gunpoint. Just thinking about that. Uh, maintaining constant contact with dispatches is, is, is awesome. You can go ahead and hit the speaker phone if you want to. Um, but I can't stress that enough. If you're going to give a physical description to yourself, make sure they understand that it's you you're talking about. Not the victims, not the suspects, but you. And then just obey every single command that law enforcement gives you. Um, it's going to be okay. It's not going to be okay. It's going to be very inconvenient for that first 15, 20, 45, an hour, four days. Um, very inconvenient. But if you're there and you use your weapon, chances are you save lives. And they're going to understand that. And it's not going to take too long in the investigation, especially these days when everything's politically driven, when we come to investigations, to understand that a citizen helped. And as we know from the news, every time a citizen stops an active shooter, we don't hear anything about it uh, because it doesn't fit the narrative. Um, but again, this has been a really, really long video. And as you can see, there's a lot of information to get into. I've just given you an abridged version of some of the stuff I cover in the class I teach. Uh, law enforcement, same thing. They get they get just as much information um, because it's a huge topic. It's not a it's not a fundamental shooting class. It's a techniques and theory class, and it's it's equipment based or it's gear based, it's theory based, and it's problem solving based. And all these things go into one total package of, in the event that you're involved or you present or you 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 have the ability to respond to an active shooter, you have a better ability with a better set of tools to solve the problem than you may have had previously. Um, but I just wanted to put this out there because I had people asking me, you know, very specific questions about it. And as you can see, this video, even with the length, I don't know if I've even scratched the surface of some of the questions that people had. I hope I've answered. I think I've answered the ones that I was asked. Uh, but there may be other questions out there. Now, I'm already planning on doing another video on uh, the EDC gear. Not active shooter response gear, but just common sense, everyday carry gear. And I'll show you kind of what I do. And if you're still working on putting your stuff together, maybe that'll help you. I'm Aaron Cowan with Stage Dynamics. Train accordingly. And roll! Where's he at?
do now! Is that good? Okay, that's good. That's good. Whoa, whoa, y'all stay in here. Hang tight, hang tight. You guys, stay to the left. 